please welcome Dr. Mike Dorkin. Nice for taking us through that journey, your journey, um, which uh, for many of us shows where we need to be for the future. Uh, our next panel uh, is going to explore the vital role that systemized collaboration plays in advancing patient safety. When Don came to the UK to help us um, 20 years ago now, um, we were at that forefront of using collaborative systems, bringing staff groups together. Um, well, what Don added was the, the impact of learning, to create a learning collaborative uh, system. Uh, and we took that up and have now created 15 learning collaborative systems across the, the 65 million population in England. Uh, and we now translated that across globally uh, with uh, help from the WHO to set up a global patient safety collaborative uh, in looking at India, Pakistan, Mongolia, Ethiopia, Sri Lanka, Kenya. Um, and uh, Afifa is here in the audience somewhere and she runs uh, uh, this uh, element of work in Pakistan. So it's good to see her. Welcome, Afifa. But this panel is going to be demonstrating to us the power of collaboration but also will bring uh, lessons uh, on collaboration uh, and how to create win-wins. What are the successful aspects of a collaboration uh, and how can we all learn from that and build on it? Collaboration sounds great, but it's hard work uh, and it must, need, uh, must lead to implementation of change. <coughs> collaboration without implementation uh, is wasting everyone's time. So I look forward to listening to this panel and uh, hand over now to uh, the panel. Thank you. Please welcome them to the stage. Thank you. Please welcome Micah Ramsey, Walter Peters, Lisa Attens, and Elizabeth Papela. First of all, uh, out of full transparency, um, I was chair of anesthesia at uh, the Baylor uh, University Medical Center for just over 30 years. I'm now chair emeritus. Uh, and I was on the board of trustees as well I was the first physician to be appointed to the Board of Trustees. Uh, now I think about 20% of the uh, members of the board are physicians. Um, so with that, um, the other thing to announce to you is that the, um, Pete McKenna, who's the CEO of Baylor Scott & White, and Baylor Scott & White now I think has got 52 hospitals in the system. It's going up every time I count. Um, uh, he leads the health system's transformation to deliver experiences that go beyond customers' traditional expectations of health care. Before becoming CEO, he served as Baylor Scott & White's president, where he advanced clinical alignment, accelerated the development of its digital health strategy, and expanded academic affiliations to help address the critical need for clinicians in Texas. Uh, previously, McKenna served as executive vice president and chief operating officer at Northwestern, so a connection to Chicago there. Uh, in total, McKenna has nearly 40 years of experience in healthcare management and consulting, um, and he holds a master's degree from the Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas in Austin. And um, he's not able to make it uh, today. Unfortunately, his father passed away, and so he's obviously got, uh, staying at home, taking care of things. But we do have a video uh, which will um, we'll show you in just a minute after I've introduced everybody else, we'll give you an overview of the Baylor Scott and White system. Uh, we have Dr. Walter Peters here, who's the chief medical officer for Baylor Scott and White. He trained as a colon and rectal surgeon, and he's been active in the College of, American College of Surgeons and American Society of Colon and Rectal Surgery. He's, part, he's been part of Baylor Scott and White for nine years. Prior to that, he spent 27 years practicing colorectal surgery in Columbia, Missouri. We have Lisa Athens, uh, is the Chief Risk Officer for Baylor Scott & White Health. She's been with the system for nine years. In her role, Lisa oversees the enterprise risk management strategy, including claims and litigation, insurance and regulatory function. She also works alongside clinical leadership to advance zero preventable harm efforts. And last we have Dr. Elizabeth Papalia, uh, is an 
highly accomplished general surgeon with over 10 years of clinical experience and a dedicated leader within Baylor Scott and White Health. She holds an undergraduate degree in economics and finance and initially planned to pursue a career in public policy research before siren, the siren song of medicine captured her heart. The unique background informs her holistic approach to, medical, to patient care and healthcare systems. In her current role as Vice President of Surgical Services, Dr. Papaila uh, oversees system-wide surgical care delivery, operational efficiency, and clinical quality, championing change management and technological integration. Uh, she's also a dedicated mentor and advocate for the next generation of medical professionals. Uh, her work's been recognized with numerous awards uh, and uh, service excellence awards. She's dedicated to leveraging her expertise and collaborative spirit to enhance patient outcomes and drive systemic improvements in healthcare. So welcome to the panel. And if we could just start with the video, I think it will give you an overview of Baylor Scott & White. Thank you for inviting Baylor Scott & White to be part of this annual summit. We appreciate the opportunity to connect with the Patient Safety Movement Foundation and its supporters to share best practices and learn from each other. I wish I could be there in person, but you're in great hands with our Baylor Scott & White leaders. Baylor Scott & White is the largest not-for-profit health system in Texas. Our mission is to promote the well-being of all individuals, families, and communities. We have 52 hospitals, over 1,200 sites of care, 52,000 team members, and we serve approximately 3.5 million customers annually. Our strategy is based on a vision of empowering you to live well. We're putting our patients and customers in the driver's seat by making healthcare more accessible, easier to navigate, and more personalized. Safety, zero harm, and quality are foundational to everything that we do. A commitment to safety also means a commitment to collaboration, bringing together diverse expertise, insights, and perspectives that are essential to identifying risks and developing solutions. We believe that providing safe, high quality care is the most customer centric thing a health system can do. So it's 100% connected to our strategy and to our vision. Safety fosters trust and trust builds loyalty. You've got a great panel of leaders from Baylor Scott and White there with you. So I'm happy to now turn it back over to you for the panel discussion. Thank you very much. Great. Well, uh, Walter, we have prepared some questions and uh, Don Berwick put some uh, challenges out there. So I'm going to switch the first question and say, if we look at what happened to Don in his early career and those cases he talked about, the baby that uh, had the error with the uh, exchange transfusion. Uh, it went quiet and Don was mortified by it, but he ne it was never discussed with the family. There was no information out there. And I'm sure probably none of the medical staff either heard about it or maybe just one or two. What would happen at Baylor, Scott and White today? Well, <clears throat> Mike, we talked over lunch. That story, those stories really resonated with me because I think as clinicians, we've been there and I could stand up and tell you about four or five cases that still haunt me, except my attorney sitting next to me would advise me not to be too specific. But um, I think we all remember those days where you were embarrassed, you were ashamed, nobody heard about it. We treated this with secrecy. And if anybody did hear about it, it was in the setting of a morbidity and mortality conference. And if you didn't already feel like a terrible human being before the M&M conference, they would fix that. You would leave feeling terrible. Um, but what would happen now in our system if we had an event uh, like the exchange transfusion? We would do a root cause analysis, but it wouldn't be just a few select people from that facility. It would involve system leaders as well. It would involve risk management and various clinical experts to really try and figure out what the root causes were and what had gone wrong. So that's step one. We would try and figure out what would happen. And the second, we would share that transparently across our system. Um, we have several venues, and, and I know Lisa will talk about this more later, but we have several venues where we share the lessons learned from these root cause analysis across our system so we can make sure that the same event doesn't happen in another one of our hospitals. 
Um, we share it transparently. We name the facility where it happened because to keep it quiet and hush hush sort of reinforces that that you should be ashamed. It reinforces that feeling of of shame. And by by being transparent, we hope to destigmatize it and say, look, this could have happened anywhere. Let's make sure it doesn't happen anywhere else. Um, and then we do something about it. We have, for instance, one call once a month where we have over 100 leaders, uh, VP and above, from across our system. And we will share usually three safety events that have happened in our system. We share the lessons learned. We ask the facility leaders to share what they're doing about it. And then we give the leaders on the call it an assignment, what they're supposed to go do to check to make sure this thing couldn't happen in their facility. So as an example, we had a recent event at one of our hospitals, a, a wrong site procedure. And the day before, and I'm being very nonspecific, uh, <laughs> the, day, the day before, uh, I notified the CMO and CNO of that facility that we were going to be talking about their case. They didn't say, oh, really, or rats. They said, great, we'll be on. And when I logged onto the call a few minutes early, they were already up there, cameras on, ready to go. I presented the case, just dry factual presentation, and then turned it over to the CMO. And he was excited to be able to share all of the things they had uncovered, opportunities that they could improve their, their performance. And, and then he shared changes they had already made in their processes and changes he was recommending to a system committee to spread across the system. And while he was talking, I realized we've changed the culture. He wasn't the least bit embarrassed to be on the call. He was proud of all that his team had uncovered and all the improvements we could make. So I, I, if Dr. Berwick is still in the room, I hope we're not perfect yet, but I hope you realize we are trying hard to make progress from the experiences you had. Thank you. So Lisa, that's why I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> risk management, uh, how do you handle the risk of being transparent? Because transparency obviously works, it's what we need to do, but um, does that add risk? Well, I think, I think historically, uh, you know, being in legal and risk, you know, we're the known as the Department of No, right behind compliance. Uh, but, you know, we've worked with our leaders and we're, we're partners. And, um, you know, there was a question at one time, how do we share these events in a way that we're, you know, maintaining the privacy of the individual, of the patient, and also that we're making sure that we're not being punitive to our staff. And so we spent a great deal of time on looking at how do we do that? And we can do that, we can easily identify situations so that we can share it beyond that department, beyond that facility, and throughout our system. And um, the way that we do that, and I think the way we do it safely, is our collaboration. Um, we have a multidisciplinary team that consists of our risk, our, uh, our medical, our nursing, uh, our quality, and our patient safety. And we really work as a team. Um, I think um, uh, Walter and Elizabeth probably get tired of seeing me, but, uh, but we really, we enjoy it and we, we build off each other. I'm not clinical, but you know, I rely on them. They're my experts. And then you know, I bring in the, the risk management aspect and the legal aspect, and we work as a team. Um, and I'll just build on uh, what Walter said. I mean, it's, it's amazing and it's to hear the people on these calls or when you go to councils, it's, uh, they're really eager to share that not that we had this bad incident, but this was a learning opportunity and we wanna share this with you so that it doesn't happen at your place. Well, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh... Just, do you have any comments on this? Uh, this is something that was never happening at Baylor when I was there up until about 10 years ago, and then it started to happen. And certainly, I was, what was most impressed for me was that uh, you could go to uh, a conference to talk about what's the surgical site wound infection rate. And twice a month, you'd get that conference, and I'd know who the anesthesiologist was, what antibiotic he gave, what was the blood sugar, what was the body temperature of the patient, was it all redosed? And you'd find out where the error was made, if an error was made, and we'd let, make sure the person involved with that error knew about it. And uh, boy, did that change culture, did that change their actions? You know, somebody who we've been preaching to, you've got to give an antibiotic at a certain time, they don't want to see their name come up again. And they make sure it is at the right time and things are corrected. Uh, how's it impacted you and in, in your, 
teaching role and your uh, surgical role? You know, I think you're really right about anesthesiologists and sharing information. One of the hard things when you're looking at improving anesthesia practice is that oftentimes those events, the surgical side infection, is remote from the anesthesiologist's care, and so it never gets back to them mm -hmm. unless you're looking for it uh, and unless you're transparent about your data. Uh, and so with that, you're exactly right. You share information and you drive change. You can't manage what you don't measure. And so if you're not looking at it and you're not talking to people about it, you're never gonna change anything. You have to have that transparency. And then one other thing that, a lot, that I'll add, you know, you have your sharing, your transparency, and your accountabil accountability. That, that accountability is everyone. Um, they need everyone, not only the person that was involved or the team that was involved, but as we share these lessons, the, we're all accountable. Everybody's accountable to go back to their facility and share that and get that to the bedside. All right. Well, Elizabeth, you were responsible for implementing a surgical safety checklist. And I can remember those coming in and, um, you know, it's based on evidence-based best practice, which we obviously we all want, um, but there was clearly some older surgeons maybe who uh, really... Uh, <laughs> did did not, he look at me? <laughs> <laughs> who, um, or older anesthesiologists who, um, you know, we've never done that. We don't need to do that. We know what we're doing. And so it was very hard to implement. How did you implement that? Right, it's almost insulting mm -hmm. to a surgeon or an anesthesiologist. Of course they know who the patient is. Of yeah. course they know what they're going to do. But as it turns out, to err is human. So in 2008, the WHO, their focus was on safe surgery. Safe surgery saves lives. And in 2009, you had an article uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, that famously showed that a surgical safety checklist cut mortality in half uh, and dramatically reduced the risk of complications in the inpatient postoperative period. And we were off to the races with checklists. Uh, Atul Gawande uh, published the checklist manifesto that same year. Uh, and in 2009, uh, then Legacy Baylor uh, did a pilot program at eight hospitals. I, I think it might have been, they chose eight because they did eight world hospitals in the WHO uh, checklist work. But they chose eight hospitals and, and they saw the results right away. Uh, and so they rolled it out to the rest of the hospitals. But it wasn't until 2019 that we looked back and said, is this, risk, is this list working for us and for our patients under our circumstances? Uh, and so in 2019, there was a big effort uh, that was undertaken to revise the checklist. And one of the huge challenges in a large system that's now combined with another healthcare system uh, at this time and is now Baylor Scott and White Healthcare is you have so many stakeholders, rural hospitals, urban hospitals, academic medical centers, critical access hospitals, and each of them has their own set of circumstances on the ground, the types of patients they take care of, the types of surgeries that they do. And so you want to develop a standard, a baseline, a bottom line that we all have to accomplish uh, to effectively communicate and provide that consistent care to our patients. And so you have to get buy-in. But how do you get buy-in from 52 different hospitals and all the anesthesiologists and all the surgeons? It can become a you know, goat rope pretty quickly, to use a term from Texas anyway, a goat <laughs> rope, uh, basically a mess. <laughs> um, and so, uh, so what we did is we pulled together a group for an in-person meeting pre-COVID. So we pulled a group together for an in-person meeting, representatives, not just surgeons and anesthesiologists, but nurses, scrub techs, uh, across the care continuum in the OR. And we went through every item and we voted on every item that was on the checklist. We took comments on every item that was on the checklist and we rolled out a new checklist. And along with rolling out the checklist, you can't just say, hey guys, here's your checklist, go for it. You have to give resources, right? So one of the roles I see for myself is to really be that easy button for the facilities. How do I build programs that facilities can take and use and implement in a way that works for them? So webinars, online education, site visits, do you actually have the poster on the wall? Does everyone know where it is? Does everyone know what their role is? 
And then in 2023, actually Dr. Peters uh, spearheaded an effort to again revise. The WHO recommends that you look every three years. We were a little busy with COVID as were the rest of you, but in 2023, uh, he did that. And I would say monthly over six months, probably, it was a topic of conversation at our enterprise-wide surgery governance council. And we went through every item. Uh, and a couple of the suggestions that we then implemented from the feedback from our frontline team members. Uh, number one, previously we had a kind of an other considerations category. But nobody was really responsible for those other considerations. Those questions weren't assigned to anyone. So now the only things on our checklist have a person who it's their job to comment. Everyone in the room has a speaking role, meaning everyone in the room is important. Uh, and, and finally, uh, a modification that I'm proud of is that we added what's called a mid-procedure timeout. So in addition to our anesthesia brief, our pre-surgical timeout, and our debrief at the end of the case, we have a mid-procedure timeout. So as you can imagine, in our large academic medical centers, you may have cases that go quite long, longer than four hours. And so that's an excellent time to reassess, is the patient properly positioned? Do they need their antibiotics redosed? How are they doing? How's the case going? Do we need to order blood? Do we need to check labs? What's their disposition going to be? And it's just an opportunity to keep everybody on the same page because nobody knows what the surgeon is thinking when they're concentrating in the field. Uh, and so this gives an opportunity for that. Great, thank you. Uh, Walter, quality and safety seem to go hand in hand. Does Baylor Scott and White take a similar approach to quality improvement? Yeah, as safety. I saw that on Dr. Burke's slide, quality yeah. and safety being separated. I didn't know whether he was pro or con, but <laughs> they do seem to go hand in hand. And um, it, so, yes, as an example, um, we have a, a very robust enhanced recovery after surgery program mm -hmm. uh, that I was involved with. And we started as a pilot just on the colorectal surgery service at our largest teaching hospital. But then we decided we wanted to roll it out to multiple service lines in all of our facilities. So. How do you do that? And, and I think uh, Elizabeth uh, hit the approach just right. That we have hospitals that vary greatly from small critical access. I think our smallest hospital has 12 beds, uh, up to a 900-bed academic uh, teaching hospital. So uh, how do you do an ERAS program that fits everybody? And so we try and strike the balance. If you, if you let it go front line up, you're going to have a different program in every hospital, and we can't support that. We don't have the resources. But if we try and do it top down, and Elizabeth and I decide the perfect program, even though it would be perfect, uh, and try and force it down on everybody, there's going to be resistance. And so we try and strike that balance that we decided as a system we wanted to do enhanced recovery. So we got together stakeholders, multidisciplinary stakeholders from across the system, not just surgeons and anesthesia, but nursing, uh, social workers, anybody who impacts a patient's recovery, and figured out what interventions supported by evidence, do you think are important that you want to include? Uh, what metrics should we use to measure that? And by the way, they need to be metrics that we can collect electronically so that we can scale without having to hire a lot of, a lot of people. And once they gave us that, then as a system, we provided the resources for project management, uh, building order sets, building dashboards, collecting data. And then we give, that, give those resources back to the facilities. And within each hospital, there's a team responsible for actually implementing the, the process. So we have, a, hopefully, a collaboration between the frontline providers who know best how their facility works and the local personalities and resources, and the system that has a lot of resources to provide expertise and, and data. And just like we've done with safety, we share that data transparently across the system. And I don't know if you've ever noticed, Mike, but surgeons tend to be competitive. And really? no surgeon <laughs> likes to see their hospital performing less well than another hospital in the system. So we share the data, not again, not to humiliate anyone, but so that if one hospital is struggling with a certain metric, they can look and see what hospitals may be doing better with it, and they can phone a friend and find out how did you improve your performance on this metric or this metric. And as a result, over a period of now seven years, we've seen just dramatic improvements in terms of shortening length of stay um, and also lowering readmissions slightly, decreasing complications. And of course, from a healthcare system in a booming part of the country where our population is growing, that helps improve access to healthcare 
uh, for our patients because we can't build hospital beds fast enough to keep up. Interesting. So, Lisa, what, what are the programs you believe drive Baylor Scott & White to zero preventable harm? I think um, one is we have that, that nature and encouragement to speak up. Uh, we, um, we have a great catch program where we highlight individuals uh, monthly um, and it can be uh, related to a, a proactive catching something before it happens. Um, and then it can be very proactive where they see something that's lacking. It could be something, an icon in Epic that will help. And um, they suggest that and um, it's implemented and it, it helps. Mm -hmm. And we recently implemented a icon around workplace violence. Um, the other thing is we have um, uh, our reporting is encouraging reporting and we found over the years that um, people, we can track it and people are reporting more, uh, reporting things that historically were not reported. Uh, and so we example? like that. Can you give an example of that? Uh, an example of that would be um, uh, something like a, um, a retained, didn't we have like a retained yeah. um, uh, object that was immediately seen and taken out? I, I will keep looking at you, so if I get too specific, okay. you'll give me the, the evil eye. <laughs> um, now, for example, we've had, uh, I'll give you one example. We had a, a fetal scalp electrode in a, a patient who had to be taken for an emergency C-section and they couldn't get the electrode to disengage, so they just cut it off with scissors very quickly because they were in a rush to get the baby out. Mm -hmm. um, the baby came out. Nobody noticed that the electrode didn't come out with it. Um, and mother and baby did fine. Mother went home and two days later called her doctor's office and said, hey, this little wire, piece of wire just fell out. Is there any, do you need it back or is there any harm? And um, they said, no, that's fine. Everything was good. But sh sure enough, a little piece of wire about this long had been left in the vagina and it fell out on its own. Absolutely no harm. That doctor took the time to call the hospital Get, get the risk manager on the phone and say, hey, this happened, so he got it reported as an unintentional retained foreign object. I've got to believe that 5, 10, 15 years ago, they said, no, just throw it in the wastebasket, that's fine, end of story, nobody would have heard about it, but now we have it reported. We actually had an RCA on it and figured out, you know, what should we tell teams to do if they ever run into this situation again? So that's an example, I think, of people reporting more right. than they would have right. in the past. And then in addition to the, the call that uh, Walter talked about that we have monthly, um, we also take these lessons learned to various councils uh, throughout the system uh, so that we can share it there as well. Uh, what we've learned is that you, you can't share these enough because I think someone mentioned earlier, we have new people coming in, we have younger people coming in. And so it's very important that this education and these the learning just continues. You know, my, if I can add on to that, uh, earlier this morning we heard that um, the story about the environmental services worker was down and didn't see how they were doing anything mm -hmm. significant. And what we try to encourage people to do is celebrate somebody who had the courage to speak up for safety, even if, even if they were wrong, even mm -hmm. if it didn't prevent a problem. You know, we, we tend to want to celebrate the people who averted a catastrophe. But it takes just as much courage to speak up whether you turn out to be right or wrong. And so an example that came up that I just love this story, we told it on one of our huddles. There was uh, a cook in one of our hospitals down in the kitchen, um, probably about as far removed from patient safety as you can imagine in the hospital. And a patient ordered an egg salad sandwich uh, for a snack. And the cook noticed that on their on their little ticket, I didn't realize this, but it lists their allergies and it said she had a dairy uh, allergy. And so the cook, before she made the sandwich, took the time to call up to the floor, get the nurse on the phone and say, hey, look, my egg salad has mayonnaise in it. Is she really allergic to dairy? And the nurse went and checked with the patient and said, no, it's just a, a little bit of a lactose intolerance. It's okay. So no harm was averted. She could have just sent the sandwich up and it would have been fine. But what I loved was that a cook in the kitchen saw that she had a role to play in patient safety and took the time to stop what she was doing and call up to make sure that she wasn't gonna mm -hmm. be contributing to harm. And that's the kind of thing we try and celebrate in our system. That's kind of what, uh, you know, 
when, when the zero home posters all went around, um, everybody working at the Baylor system had to write a commitment to what they were going to do to prevent harm. And that was everybody from the guy parking the car to the top CEO. And yeah. uh, I thought that was very interesting. We still have that. We call it our commitment to the core. Yeah. Okay. And uh, it, it, one of our values is that we're all in it together. And so that's why we all are working together on patient safety. Um, and as you heard our CEO say, um, we're trying to empower you to live well. And it, we just think it's foundational to that, that that means keeping people safe while they trust us with their care. And then one other program that we have that um, I think we're very proud of is our peer support program. And, you know, we've heard today about when a provider is involved in an adverse event, how that affects them. And when we, whenever we have an adverse event, the peer support team is the first team to be contacted because we want that team member to have the support that they, they need. Um, it's a small team. Uh, but we have over 500 volunteers uh, in our program, and that's physicians, nurses, techs, non-clinical uh, uh, staff members uh, that are really there to help. And a lot of them have been involved in something, and they're there to support that team member. Yeah. That's great. Uh, you know, we're not just a patient safety movement foundation. We're a patient safety and healthcare worker mm -hmm. uh, safety foundation. And... Uh, Two labor and delivery nurses were shot and killed over at Methodist Hospital across mm -hmm. town mm -hmm. uh, last year, I think it was. Um, what measures are Baylor, Scott and White, taking to protect healthcare workers? We have a large uh, workplace violence group. We have a, a governance committee. Uh, we're fortunate we have our own uh, public safety department. Uh, most of our public safety members are armed. We have um, weapon detection in uh, most of our EDs. Additionally, we just recently imp implemented a visitor manager management program where when you come through the door, you know, if I come through the door, I have to have my badge on. If not, I've got to have a driver's license uh, and you have to have ID and, and have a purpose to be there. Um, during mm -hmm. COVID, we, we um, we limited access to our facilities, particularly our large uh, campuses. Um, after you know COVID, some of them were opened up again, but we still have that limited access to our facilities. We have um, doors that are closed, you know, at night, at dark, mm -hmm. uh, that don't open up into the morning. Um, so those are some of the things that we're doing. But the vi visitor management program, um, there was some concern because are we creating yet another um, avenue for someone to get angry that they have to show their mm -hmm. driver's license and they can't just walk in? And frankly, we haven't had any issues. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's been a great morale booster for our staff. And they really feel like, because after the Methodist, that was, you yeah. know, who, who, is in our, who is in our facility? And really, you don't know. Um, and this visitor management system has helped. Um, so anything else, John? It, it's I good. think there's also, a, we've also posted educational mm -hmm. information in all of our hospitals about how this is a place for healing, no violence or harassment will be tolerated. And it's not, it's, it's message to patients and their family, but it's also message to staff in a way that I think is inclusive of everyone that we're going to create this environment of healing together, but it takes all of us. Wonderful. For those of you from your, uh, the UK or Europe where guns may be, not be as prevalent. It was a, a real eye-opener when we first put our first magnetometers up in the EDs um, to see how many people would come in, start to come in, see the magnetometer, and then turn and go back out to the parking lot to leave their gun in the car uh, or the truck. Um, and one of the first people caught actually with a gun on their person who didn't do that was an 84-year-old woman with an enormous handgun, about an eight-inch barrel, weighed eight pounds, and she said she forgot it was in her purse. I don't know how she forget, but I, it was like a small artillery piece, but um, it, it was eye-opening how many weapons probably had been walking around the halls of our hospital and we didn't know it. Yeah. Uh, Elizabeth, what haven't I asked you? <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, I think uh, we have hit on this, but I just want to emphasize the importance of that change management, that it, 
it's, you can't just top down say, this is what we're going to do. Sure, we know that doing a timeout process, not just the surgical brief, but the whole process from beginning to end is important. We know that that's evidence-based, best medicine. But we can't just say that and design it ourselves. You have to have buy-in from the frontline team members because it's the only way you're gonna see where the barriers are. Everyone wants to do the right thing. No one wants something bad to happen to a patient. We've heard that multiple times today. I really, Dr. Berwick said that hot surge of crisis and I really felt that turn of phrase viscerally because I think anyone who takes care of patients has unfortunately felt that feeling and no one wants to feel that way. So if we're not following evidence-based best practices, why aren't we? And we can't know that unless we involve the front line, uh, unless we elevate their voice and really ask them and listen to them and implement their recommendations. So that's key. And then of course, always going back and seeing. One of the challenges, of course, I'm sure you've all seen this, you do audits in your operating rooms and Somebody walks in with a clipboard to make sure that you're doing the timeout process correctly and everybody knows that you're there with a clipboard to see if you're doing the timeout process correctly. So lo and behold, we do it, you know, 100% of the time. We're amazing. We're perfect. We never make any errors. We never overlook anything. The surgeons are always very open to having it done correctly. Never any pushback. Uh, and so one of the challenges is really, how do you see beyond that? And so one of the things we've also implemented in our facilities, um, are the unit-based safety programs where frontline team members actually lead the committee to talk about what the barriers are, where they see problems, uh, and then leaders, the OR director, maybe the uh, physician director of surgical safety, they participate, they're members, they get to attend, but they are not the key voice. They're really just there to help then facilitate and implement the recommendations that come out of the committee. And I think that that's a really key program as well. There's one question here, and that is, uh, why are quality and safety departments separate in healthcare? Are ours or are not? <laughs> well, ours are pretty well integrated. Um, it, it both uh, report to the same leader. Mm -hmm. um, both report up to me. So we do have coordination between quality and safety. Um, our system, to be honest, is a product of a merger and the two legacy systems had different organizational structures and we're still in the process of getting things just the way we want. But our mm -hmm. quality and safety do work hand in hand. Um, I think it's sometimes a very hard line to draw whether something's a quality improvement project or a patient safety improvement. So we're trying to make it one as much as we possibly can. If you read the joint commission reports, uh, I think it's the joint commission, they'll. Uh, say that uh, wrong site surgery is still a major complication in healthcare in the United States. Why would that be when we got these measures in place? How can that still happen? I mean, are they just not done properly? Are they, or is there another factor that we're missing out? Is it turning a patient? Is it not checking a CT scan? Or, or um, how can that still happen? It, I think I mean, it's really communication. Really? I mean, some of it is. Uh, some is communication. Some of it is, I hate to say it, but surgeons and anesthesiologists sometimes just go on autopilot. Mm -hmm. um, it, in our experience, two of the more common things to still get done wrong site would be a nerve block, where mm -hmm. um, you, you, despite the, the, what the consent might say, can, despite what the schedule says, if you walk into the room and things are set up backwards, you know, somebody's put the tray on the wrong side, uh, an anesthesiologist will be in a hurry to get a block and just do the wrong, the wrong side. Okay. Um, and then for surgeons, in the last couple of years, one of the most common things to happen is when you have something that's just out, something you do very routinely, but then one day you throw a twist. Um, tonsils and adenoids, tonsils and adenoids, tonsils and adenoids, T's and A's, T's and A's, T's and A's, T's. There's an occasional case where you don't take the adenoids mm -hmm. and they forget, and just because they typically do the two together, they forget and just on autopilot um, or hysterectomy, oophorectomy, hysterectomy, oophorectomy. And one time it's supposed to be just the hysterectomy, not the oophorectomy, and they forget. And so I think sometimes we get in a comfort zone, surgeons get in a comfort zone in the OR. It's our place we feel less stressed than maybe in the clinic or any place else. And you just go on autopilot. And we have to figure out how to break that sense of complacency and have people remember that this is a dangerous environment 
with all kinds of opportunities to make mistakes mm -hmm. and yet not be so stressed that they can't function. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, and to that end, right, research has shown this, personalizing the patient, you know, it's not the next gallbladder, it's not the next tonsil, it's, you know, Jimmy who plays soccer and is looking forward to their summer vacation. Uh, and that everybody in the team knows that this is Jimmy and he plays soccer and he's looking forward to his next summer vacation because it's a lot easier to look out for Jimmy. The other thing I remind my teams when we're talking uh, about, you know, go slow to go fast, right? Slow down, do the procedure properly and insist on doing it every room. So I have the ability to say, hey, circulating nurse, we didn't quite hit the checklist or not everyone really stopped and listened. You are in charge of this. You're gonna set the tone. You're gonna stand there evenly on your two feet. I show them their posture and you're gonna wait until everyone's ready and, that, and they'll get ready. Even the most stubborn surgeons will get ready for you if you just wait. You're just quiet. You know, silence is very powerful. Mm. Um, and so personalization, owning it and recognizing that really when patients are in the OR, it's not over-dramatizing to say they are literally the most vulnerable they'll be in their entire lives. They're naked, they're unconscious, they are completely at our mercy. And whether we choose to look out for them or we choose to treat it like the next knee surgery makes a huge difference, I think. Mm -hmm. One thing I know is having been on both sides of the fence, having been a patient as well as being a deliverer of anesthesia, um, and that is, it's always best if you can bring somebody with you, like your wife uh, or loved one, because, uh, you know, I, I knew everything that was going to go on in the hospital. I knew all about all the system, everything. And yet I couldn't recall exactly some of the messages I was given during that or close to that procedure, you know, post-operatively, you know, do this, do that, do the other. And I'm having to go back to Zoe and say, what do they tell me? <laughs> you know, and I think when you're under stress as a patient, uh, you're not as reliable as you might be if uh, you're going to go buy a car or do something, you know, a little bit more tangible than uh, letting somebody work on you. And um, so I think that's uh, something that uh, I think also is very important is if they can bring somebody with you to be your advocate uh, when you're coming in to have a procedure. It, that's very helpful. Well, it's certainly an opportunity we've identified looking at, say, readmissions. Mm -hmm. Is I, I don't know how other systems work. Um, I, I've been on both sides of the, the, the uh, deal as well as a patient. And I went home after a, just an outpatient surgery with, I think it was about a 28-page uh, folder of instructions. When my follow-up appointment was, it was buried, I think, on page five. The number to call if I was having problems was on page seven. And because of the nature of the procedure, I was on my back. I had three sets of instructions for laminectomy, discectomy, and spine surgery generic. And they all said about the same thing, but they took up about 12 pages out of my folder. We've got to do a better job of learning how to communicate with our patients. And to the points that were made earlier about health equity, we have to recognize that not everybody has the same level of uh, health literacy, and we need to do a much better job, uh, not just you know, having a, a spouse or significant other to give instructions to, but make sure we're communicating a way they can, they can understand. Uh, I think that's probably a challenge for all of us in this room. And we are moving towards that in um, some of our procedures, and hopefully we'll scale it, but just giving those simple instructions, and we're doing that through some of our uh, navigation. You know, and another thing I think has been uh, really helpful actually in our discharge process is because of our capacity challenges, you know, Texas is a booming state, so we have people moving in all the time, and so we're often facing limitations in the care we can provide because our, our beds are full, our ERs are full. Uh, and so we've spent a lot of time looking at how we can create more capacity by providing higher quality, more efficient care. And one of those uh, programs has been what we call a discharge lounge, where patients, when they're ready to discharge, but they're going to wait for the medicine to be delivered from the pharmacy or the last piece of home medical equipment isn't mm -hmm. quite here yet they'll be transferred to the discharge lounge where you have two nurses whose sole job all day long is to discharge patients. So they really do develop that specialty, that expertise in communicating what patients need to know in a way that they need to know it. And I think that that's been really useful. 
One of the things that impressed me, and this would be the last question, I think we're almost out of time, uh, but that is when we started, we talked about all the information I got as head of anesthesia of cases like you've got a post-op wound infection, you know, what was the body temperature, et cetera. But to get that information, Vader must have invested into a very significant analytic department uh, to be able to get that information. Um, presumably this cost was very worthwhile because you've, you've recouped it all on the improved outcomes, right. fewer complications. So. We, we invest a lot. We use Epic. We're an Epic shop. And uh, so we use Epic as our source of truth for mm -hmm. um, almost all of our quality and, and metrics. And particularly like with enhanced recovery, yes, we, there was a lot of upfront work. You have to have collaboration because we can't allow each hospital to have a different definition of, say, early ambulation or early diet advancement or, mm -hmm. or things like that. We had to get common definitions. We had to define it as to what the source of truth was within the electronic medical record uh, and then build dashboards. The result of that work, though, that was an upfront investment and in, I don't know how many hundreds or thousands of hours of, of epic build time. But the result is now we can scale this across uh, any number of service lines or any number of patients and get almost real-time data. Uh, our process metrics will update at midnight every night. Oh, really? And so, uh, yes, yeah, so you don't have to wait, like with manual chart abstraction, to wait months to find, uh, find out how you're doing on a metric. Uh, every day you can find real-time how you're doing so far this month on hypoglycemic uh, events or hyperglycemic control or hypothermia. You can find up-to-date information for our providers. Um, so it was an upfront investment, but I'm so glad we did it. Great. Okay, well, uh, thank you all very much indeed. And um, thank you for my experience of Vela, I must say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.